see points on the board. Antonio Brown, spectacular catch! Patriot fans, they've been waiting for this for quite some time. He's gonna score! That's it, that's it, that's it. Gary Wright! Oh, what a catch! Fans, juice is loose. Steelers just got the job done. Unbelievable! Vikings win it! Odell Beckham Jr. on the post. Touchdown, Giants! One of the fans doing a live story on Snapchat. Unbelievable! Let the celebrations begin! Good morning and welcome to another session of RBC Disruptors. I'm John Stackhouse and it's my pleasure to host our monthly conversation about disruption, innovation and how technology is uh, changing the world around us. If you're watching us on WebEx or Facebook Live, welcome as well. Please join the conversation throughout sharing your, your questions or thoughts on uh, Facebook and we'll, uh, we'll get them into the conversation. Uh, today we're joined, we're so lucky to be joined by uh, Marianne Turk. She's the president of digital media at the NFL, the National Football League, and she's here to talk about the content revolution that we're all facing. I'd like to say her product is football, but her challenge is audience engagement in a massively uh, disrupted and increasingly fragmented world. Marianne is responsible for leading the operations of the NFL network as well as overseeing the league's media assets including NFL Films, NFL Digital, and NFL.com. She's Canadian. Uh, before going to, uh, to LA to work with the NFL, she was president of uh, Bell Media. Marianne, welcome to RBC. Welcome back to Toronto. Thanks, Thanks for joining so us. Yeah. It's good to be back. And the weather is cooperating. The weather's cooperating. You brought a bit of LA maybe with you. Uh, Marianne travels a lot. She just said she's not been back home to LA since January. But <laughs> among her wanderings, of course, she was at, uh, you were at the Super Bowl. Yeah, yep. Who are you cheering for? You know, we're technically not allowed to say, but um, I always like a good underdog. And um, So the Patriots? <laughs> as it would happen. Yeah, as it would happen. Um, I just, you know, you couldn't escape the story of Nick Foles and the worst to first story of the Eagles this year. And um, I think everybody sort of had a special place in their heart. And I, if, I don't know how it came across on television, but it was like an Eagles home game. Really? <laughs> yeah. There was a lot of green and white going on, so it was exciting, sure. So mo most of our conversation is going to be about content disruption and, uh, and media disruption, uh, which you're seeing on the front lines uh, every, every hour of every day. The headline stat out of the Super Bowl was uh, TV viewership was down, I think it was 8%, but even then it was, what, the 10th most watched TV show in history? Mm -hmm. So that's amazing. But this decline in viewership, how are you thinking about that? As a, as a business challenge? How do you think through when you see those, those declines? So we tend to think about it in, in two different ways. Um, going to sort of first principles is fandom. And fans watch football. So how are you uh, retaining, just like you would in a normal business? How do you retain and attract new customers? We think constantly about how do we ret retain and attract new fans, and then we say in media, we follow our fans. So when fans are moving from uh, kind of broadcast television to streaming to over the top to products like the Red Zone, um, uh, we have a, like a, a game summary, an eight minute game summary that we put on Facebook. We think about it in that way, right? So even though the, the tide is kind of doing this on television, and I actually think, and we were talking about this earlier, that. Um, there has never been more choice in television viewing and some of the entertainment products on the market right now, whether it's you know, Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, it's, it's prolific and it's really good. So there's a lot of choice now and then it's on demand. So um, you know, we work really hard to make our, game, make our games exciting and so that people say, if it's a blowout at halftime, like 40 to three, Oh, well, I may as well catch up on the last episode of whatever it is because it's on demand. So we, we sort of think about it in that way, create, keeping our fans, getting new fans, and following them where they want to watch and making that game exciting. 
But the business model is still dependent to a large degree on that mass audience of being yeah. able to deliver through classic channels 100 million people or 50 million people, say, on a typical, uh, more typical day. How are you thinking about the fragmentation of that part of the model? So the, the can business you, can model. Can you save it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the business model is based on mass audiences, but it's based on advertising. And it's based, we are content creators, and broadcasters, particularly in the States, pay a lot of money for our product because they can still make a lot of money from ad sales off of it. And why that's important? Because increasing the fragmentation means that the relative value or the relative importance of your content, the relative quality of your content, is what becomes most important. When you're out, think about it if you were um, an executive for CBS or Fox and you were out selling ad spots on football, what would you be saying? You'd be saying that we are increasing our spread over primetime television. We are increasingly becoming more important relative to other primetime programming. Sunday Night Football, seventh year in a row, the number one show in prime time in, in the States. Thursday Night Football, the number two show in prime time. 37 of the top 50 shows are still NFL football. So when we kind of think about that, we really think about, I said it earlier, you know, if you've got a, if you're swimming really fast and someone puts a t-shirt on you, you start swimming slowly. As long as you keep your distance in front of the other guys, you're still going to win. You know, you're still that when you're talking to agencies and you're talking to people who are writing checks to put their brand beside the NFL football and put their money in spots. It's important to be, to keep your distance, to keep your relative lead. So, so for advertisers, you're still the top choice or among the top choices in a, in a world of Absolutely. increasing choice. Absolutely. I mean, we just did a new um, Thursday Night Football deal with Fox that broadcast television, and they're very excited about it. We're doing all sorts of work with them. You know, it's, uh, and we had multiple bidders on that product, so it's not going anywhere. Let's uh, talk about this idea of fandom, which is, is, mm -hmm. is, is fascinating, um, because you, you've talked before about how NFL is the ultimate team sport. Uh, football is family. Uh, even though there's great personalities like a Tom Brady, uh, most of the hundreds of players in the league are not known, uh, and certainly not household names. Different from, say, the NBA, where there's more right. celebrity players, yeah. uh, one, would, one would argue. How do you make that transition, especially in a sport where people are, are literally masked not, uh, and not known to the so, general public? Yeah, we, I would characterize our position as being um, behind the NBA in terms of individual stardom and making superstars out of players. And the NBA has a head start on us there. Um, I mean, Kobe Bryant was the first one who really broke out and actually started his own media company, did a lot of work in China. Um, attracted fans all over the world, and then you see a, a lot of players following suit. I think it, the football culture is really, it is so much team first, individual second. And I think even, you know, if you're close to the, the game, you would have seen a couple of years ago, you know, Odell Beckham Jr. Uh, sort of, you know, tr stepping out and doing some things on social media, and it was a little bit of a, hmm, you know. I think that in general, individuals are getting more comfortable with that because the fact is is that the average football career is less than five years, right? So the, there's a, a cohort now of players who they've come from being famous in high school on social media, in college on social media, and now obviously in, in the NFL. So we, as a content factory, we're really helping them with that. And um, I don't know if the ad plays here or not, but we've got a whole uh, promotion on Know My Name, and it really starts with kind of we peel back the white stripes off the college football to unveil the NFL football, and it starts to really promote the combine, which is next week, and moving on into the draft, and we're specific about the top five or six prospects and what that's going to mean, and we really did a lot of work with Carson Wentz, we did a lot of work with Kareem Hunt, these were breakout stars in, um, for, in their rookie year, so all of that is really helping, and, um, and we're focused on the domestic market, obviously, and then we'll go international. Yeah, I'd like to come back to the international challenge, but talk first, if you will, about this idea of the content factory. That's what you were right. brought in to do. Maybe you can explain a bit of what the uh, strategic challenge was that the league laid down for you to take on through NFL Network, NFL Films, and the other channels that you're now responsible for. Right, so NFL Network is a, a TV channel that if you're an avid fan here, you likely know about it and have watched it. It's um, in 75 or 70 million homes in the States, 
um, and not that many here. <laughs> and it really is all football all the time. And we have, uh, we were charged with um, making our audience younger. So we launched a show called Good Morning Football. And it's really, you know, from 7 to 10 Eastern time. And it's young people talking football. They have a lot of fun. They cross over into pop culture. And then at the other end of the spectrum, on our Sunday morning, we really have, we went heavy into Hall of Famers. And we have Irv and, you know, a bunch of guys on that show who really do a good job. Kurt Warner's on that show, hosted by Rich Eisen, who's a really kind of prominent and famous sports uh, host. And we own those two day parts now. So that channel has had its best ratings ever. So that would be more on the, I'll call it traditional television side, but we uh, cross promote all of those shows and properties through social media and everything like that. And then all the way on the other side is our fantasy product, um, our red zone product, things like that that we're building. Uh, we haven't invested as much as we should have in our fantasy product, so our game experience isn't what it should be, and we're launching a new one this year. Um, and then on social media, you know, every single owned and operated digital media asset is feeling this, right? I mean, your old uh, employer, right? Like globalmail.ca or .com would have had a lot of people going to it. Now, where do you get your news? You get your news from your curated news feed from social media. So it's the same. Even within digital media, there's disruption. And so we've got NFL.com and we've got NFL Mobile, and we are seeing owned and operated viewership um, staying flat or increasing just a bit. But overall consumption of NFL um, digital media content is really, really high because we weren't, we didn't license um, content to Facebook. And that, this is the first year we did. So we really built a content factory for just building short form video for Facebook. And now it's fantastic. And that's where people want to view it. So it's really about, and I keep coming back to with, you know, the ownership group and others who say, what's, what are you doing, right? <laughs> it's the more American, well, the more people around the world that watch football, the better we are. We gotta go where they are, and we gotta reverse engineer the monetization model underneath it. We can't, it, it, the world is changing, right? Like Facebook has two billion worldwide viewers. The relative importance of the NFL to other things isn't what it would be on a domestic product. So it's being disrupted in there in the middle, but we're just creating content for Twitter, for Facebook, for Snapchat, for Instagram, for our own handles, and for kind of distribution on other platforms. Well, I imagine the owners would would ask you how you balance Facebook, which is probably dollar per viewer uh, worth way less than Fox. How do you balance that for them as they're trying to maintain their their revenue stream? Ooh, you're you're like delivering a Facebook is trying to maintain their revenue stream. No, as the NFL is. If you're doing oh yeah, so I mean we look. It goes something like this. <laughs> you know. Hey, Facebook, it'd be really nice to <laughs> license some content. And they say, OK, we'll pay you this much money. And then you negotiate and you negotiate what it is. And it's never quite the same as um, digital advertising dollars on owned and operated. But I really think that you cannot give up the reach that those global platforms have. You just can't. So are we replacing dollar for dollar from owned and operated to licensing? No, but over time, I think that the benefit of like um, acquiring new fans and retaining fans by having our content on those platforms, it, like I said, fans watch football, right? And casual fans watch football on television. They may not watch the whole game, but they'll, they'll tune in. So let's talk a bit about the product, and then maybe we can get to some of the audience, uh, audience challenges. Uh, the product, this notion of a three-hour block of anything, but a three hour block of entertainment is a challenge in a world where no one's buying three hour blocks, at least from a, a, an individual point of view. How do you balance that? What do you mean no one's buying three hour blocks? People don't sit for three hours to watch anything. And you're offering a three hour uh, 15 million game. people a game. No, but they'll be in and out of it. So how do you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. How do, how do so you, the average, look, I mean, we talked about the stats earlier about how sort of the relative uh, popularity of football, right? There has been, I'm just joking with you, because lots of people watch we know each football other. games. <laughs> um, but it's, we are working hard on, um, you know, 
delays in the game and the, the deadly double up, we call it, where you go, uh, and this is in the traditional world, you go to a break before the conversion or you go to a break before a punt and then you come back and then the punt is made and then you go straight to a break after. Like that just makes people insane, right? Mm. And what we have found is that when we, we did a lot of uh, consumer research, it's not the overall length, it's how many breaks. And actually, I'd prefer it if, this is what sort of we heard back from the research, I'd prefer it if, even if you had the same number of minutes of commercial breaks, if you had it in, you know, big, longer chunks, you know, and then I can go up and get my beer and my popcorn and everything else, right? But it's, um, we're working hard on that. We're working hard on um, uh, sideline technology. So I run all the technology for the league, too. So all the... Uh, Microsoft Surface tablets that you see with the guys running out onto the field for the for the replay for the refs to check, um, all that is meant to speed up the process. We have a command and central in New York that helps make some of the controversial calls, and that's all meant to sort of uh, go make the process a lot faster when you have those breaks in the game. But it's been a uh, like game presentation is a big part of what we talk about with the owners every year and. Just it's not, if there were a silver bullet, we would have found it by now, but it's about, you know, marginal gains every year to try and kind of squeeze it in. Now, there's other engagement tools. You mentioned fantasy, for, for yep. instance. Where do you see that going, and how, do, how will that affect or interact uh, with, the, with the main product, with the game? So fantasy is an interesting product, right? I think that um, it's, many people who play fantasy don't watch the game. They, they play fantasy and they watch Red Zone. Um, a lot of people use it as a companion sort of tool, and some people do it because there's a fantasy group in their fantasy league in their workplace and they, they want to do it. We, um, our fantasy use is stable, and going forward, I think I see it integrating a little bit more with a linear product so that you have um, kind of interaction with uh, the red zone. So red zone would be on your television screen, and then you can see your own fantasy numbers as things go. You can, we're developing prototypes where, you know, you can see the rest of the players in your, the rest of the teams in your league and what they're doing, and you can interact with them on Snapchat or Twitter or just messaging them and chirping them and with little gifts and fun things. So that's kind of where we see fantasy going, and um, it's an important product for us because it drives a lot of traffic to other properties. Well, if, if you can share your insights on other leagues when you watch what they're doing, not only with fantasy but with esports and other extensions, what do you what, what impresses you? Well, I think esports is interesting. Um, I I'm not as familiar exactly with what the other leagues are doing, and we're not. We have a really big relationship with Madden, mm -hmm. and we're thinking about um, how does fantasy and esports work well together. I mean, look, there's a lot of um, the NBA, for instance, is, um, has a little bit of a different perspective on let's call it sports betting, and like daily fantasy, we aren't comfortable with. We want to maintain the integrity of the game, and I think the commissioner of the NBA is. He, well, he's come out, and he's they, there's daily fantasy, and there's even betting on each play, right? So um, it's a little bit of a different perspective on that whole game interaction, you know, in the game thing than, than the NFL has. Take an audience from uh, Facebook, a uh, question here, sorry, from uh, Facebook about uh, about your audience and the esports challenge. Uh, it's, it's certainly an interesting demographic challenge because we're yeah. seeing, or you're, you're seeing, sort of a whole generation engage with sports in just a very a fundamentally different way, and esports speaks uh, speaks to that. How do you see the NFL evolving to appeal to millennials and to engage them maybe in different ways than uh, than we've seen in the past? Well, part of it, separate and apart from esports, part of it is what we've been talking about, right? Um, and I will tell you, uh, we did a we did fantastic work this year on Thursday Night Football. We came out with a campaign that said, your weekend starts here. And the spots that we made to support that campaign were, a, I, were was a, a young woman actually in labor in the hospital, and she gets up out of labor and she turns on the television because it's Thursday night, she wants to watch Thursday Night Football. Another spot that we made was a bunch of, um, unfortunate people who were stuck around a conference call with their boss somewhere, you know, obviously not there, and, you know, kind of 
it was sort of that who's on first kind of conversation, and then you know they go to the bar to watch Thursday night football. And we saw a tremendous uptick, like double digit uptick in our 18 to 49 audience in that by sort of focusing on that because it's a you know it's just it's a social thing to do on Thursday night. You finish work, you go to the pub, and you watch uh, you watch Thursday night football. We did the same thing with Good Morning Football. So we've done a lot of work on that younger fan base, getting them in. Um, Esports really, uh, I think the jury is still out, honestly, for us. I mean, it's do we, um, do we cultivate esport players in a different game? Do we cultivate them in football and have people watching other people play football? We have thought about an esport where you literally, the, the sport is people playing fantasy. Mm -hmm. And the eSport is people watching people play fantasy and they watching people do daily trades. And obviously that would be a little bit more exciting with daily fantasy, but there's something in there um, and we're interested to see what may, may come in the future there. Do you watch uh, Dude, Dude Perfect? YouTube? I don't, no. So it's, it's a, a YouTube phenomenon. Uh, it's, it was created by a couple of guys out of SMU, Southern Meth Methodist University, who just do antex crazy shots. Oh, uh, yeah. home, it's, it's started as home video, but they're now, you know, they typically get 20 to 40 million viewers on YouTube, and it's a, it's a phenomenal little business model. But when I, when I watch it and, and, and follow how younger millennials sort of gravitate to that versus the highlights model, I wonder how leagues are sort of balancing that millennial appetite for homemade content that they can share and interact with versus the professional content. Yeah, we discuss that I at, mean, uh, it's, at the league? We, we get a lot of heavy traffic on our YouTube channels. Um, and it is largely, like you said, highlights and things like that. But we find that people want to consume it and they, they go after it hard. We are working, though, on, I wouldn't call it homemade content because we want, we, we talk about my, the NFL media CMO and I, we talk about handing the shield over to the fans. Mm -hmm. and building homemade content and we started a little bit on Thursday Night Football just with um, like Jib Jab, we did a deal with Jib Jab where on Wednesday at I think it was noon or something we would launch all these graphics so that over Snap and over other social media people could sort of chirp each other about the Thursday Night game and create your own content and then a little bit more on the product produced scale I would say we are going to start working with some players on helping them. I mean, I don't know how many of you guys have seen the um, Tom versus Time series on Facebook. A few. Yeah, than, so it's, I mean, it, it wasn't produced by NFL. It was produced by a guy that used to work for NFL Films. And he, it's stuff like that that I think is going to be interesting for us going forward. And we, we want fans to create their own um, content. And we've actually taken some of it and launched it on our own handles and things like that. And that's so far how we're going about it. So on, on the subject of content, the, the league has had some obvious uh, and very visible challenges, brand challenges over the last uh, year, certain, certainly from take a knee to domestic violence and on and mm -hmm. on. How do, you, how do you manage those conversations internally and from a digital marketing and a content point of view, how do you see managing that going forward? Well, you know, let's start with domestic violence, right? And that um, started a few years ago with the Ray Rice incident. And honestly, it was, um, these conversations are super real. I mean, it's 12 to 15 people, senior leaders at the NFL around the table with Roger talking about issues like this. And uh, Roger is the most thoughtful. So this would be Roger Goodell, yeah, the, the commissioner. He's the most thoughtful. He's so thoughtful on these things, and it's really been one of the um, kind of pleasures of working there. And um, he's, uh, he really, we dug in hard with domestic violence. A lot of the players have actually taken up that cause in their own communities. We're committed to lots and lots of training and lots and lots of investigations. I mean, they're all kind of out in the open. Uh, we take it super seriously. And so that conversation has been going on for a while. And then, of course, this year with um, the anthem issue and social justice reform and things like that, that was, um, I think it was handled really in an interesting fashion and a good lesson because, you know, it was so public, uh, complete with a pre presidential tweet, um, that we really wanted to 
uh, have the conversation with coaches, with owners, with players. And we talked to a lot of players. Roger uh, did a lot of ride-alongs with uh, the police in um, communities where some of these young men were coming from and they were fighting for social justice reform. Um, I myself had to learn a lot about some of the historical issues there uh, coming from Canada. Um, and we talked a lot and we came up with different ideas and there is now a players coalition that we're working with where we are investing money on a platform that is around social justice reform. So you guys all probably remember kind of the breast cancer awareness when everything turned pink on the field. We don't quite know how it's all going to be. It's all kind of in motion now, but there's money set aside and there are players investing in their communities. There are teams investing in their communities. And um, we felt that that was a better approach, not just for the league, but for America. Uh, we felt that it would uh, produce the kind of changes that we want to see in the communities. The players agreed. And so that is why the decision was made not to like, you must stand or you must do this. Like it was a very, very thoughtful, difficult conversation because it, unlike domestic violence where you tend not to split your fan base down the middle, everyone kind of agrees that that's a bad thing. This national anthem thing did split the fan base down the, the middle and it was a challenging, challenging thing for us. So I can only imagine what that was like for you. You're brought in to expand or help expand the audience, change or uh, broaden, right. broaden the demographic reach and then these issues come along. How did, how did you manage those from a uh, management or an executive point of view? You know, like, like you manage any other challenge, you just put your left foot in front of your right foot and you just, you know, it's, it's incremental steps of here's what's facing me today and here's, here, here are the challenges we're going to have. Um, you know, even before certain games where we knew that there might be issues, what can we do? What conversations can we have with players, with coaches and everything? And is there anything that we can do? Like it was, it was really all hands on deck to try and, um, you know, really work with the players and manage kind of the overall messaging. It was literally one foot in step in front of the other all season long. And it was a, it was a big challenge. And you can imagine that um, Rini Anderson, who's a fantastic woman who runs our, you know, over a billion dollar sponsorship business, she's getting a few phone calls. Um, and she did a great job just, you know, gutting it out and, you know, reassuring sponsors and, and doing what we could do. Um, I think it got a lot better over the course of the season. What, sure. what did you learn from those conversations with sponsors? Well, I mean, look, they really, um, they really appreciate being affiliated with the, with the NFL. It's a, a, an unbelievably popular brand in the States. And I know we all know it here and everything. And I surely I have spent a lot of money buying NFL content when I was at Bell Media. But I don't think anything can compare to going down there and living in the States and experiencing football. I mean, it's just, it starts in the middle of August and it's all anybody talks about almost. Mm -hmm. So I think that, um, you know, the sponsors were, they want to, are we okay here? Are we okay here? Is this going to, are we on a kind of upward trajectory of this getting worse? Or are we going to get better here? And, you know, we did get better and we um, talked to them, took them under the tent a little bit and told them what we were thinking of doing. And it was just, uh, manage block and tackle, as they say. <laughs> Good question here from Facebook, which you touched on a bit, but maybe you can expand on the demographic uh, opportunities as well as the challenge for the NFL. Uh, as you try to expand, especially female uh, engagement with, uh, with the sport and the content that you're creating, what, uh, what are you learning? What are the opportunities that you, uh, that you see there? Well, you know, um, I mean, our female fandom is uh, very high and um, it's, uh, it, you know, it would reflect the population generally. And I think that a lot of people are surprised to hear that. I, when I was running TSN here, it, you know, our viewership was almost 50-50. So it's, um, you know, it's not necessarily trying to attract women per se, but it's really uh, that younger demographic. Um, we are the Hispanic demographic in the States is really important. And we, with, with the new deal with Fox, with Thursday Night Football, there was going to be a Spanish element there. Um, 
uh, with a Spanish-speaking network. So I think that'll be very helpful. And you know, big, big franchises in like Dallas Cowboys and the Houston Texans, they have a lot of Hispanic fans, and I think that'll be fantastic. And, and you're trying to grow your audience uh, internationally, which I find fascinating given that, as you were saying, this is the quintessential American sport. Mm -hmm. uh, un unlike basketball, which travels a little, a little more, uh, maybe the, the same is true for, for other sports. How do, you, um, how do you think about selling the product in new markets, you're in Europe, Mexico, China possibly? Yeah. What are, what are the challenges there? I mean, what we've done so far, We've, we've put games there, right, to increase fandom, and honestly, they, they sell out like crazy, and they sell out quickly, and the experience what is the really, really special. I think it's, it's the game, right? It's the game. It's an exciting game. People have heard about uh, either they're expats that are living over there, or they've heard about the game. They're at their very famous uh, sort of soccer stadiums. And they're, they're going for the experience and to see something that they don't normally see. So it could be a scarcity thing, but Mark Waller, who runs our international business, I think has done a fantastic job. He's from the UK, and he's done a great job of, um, you know, we've got a broadcast partner. Sky is our broadcast partner over there. So between, you know, the broadcast partner and what we do over there, we're really promoting it hard. We get a lot of sponsors internationally as well. And then it's around... Um, creating international fandom with some of the players, mm -hmm. right, like what the NBA did. I think it's, you know, football's different because, you know, it's not an Olympic sport, right? So you don't have countries um, developing football players all over the place, right, to compete in the Olympics. So it's different from basketball, it's different from hockey in that, in that regard, and even baseball to some extent, right? So it's, um, uh, it's an interesting challenge. And in Mexico, um, I don't know if it's, I don't know where you can find it up here, but uh, Danny Amendola did a uh, went down and did an unbelievable uh, piece um, in in Mexico before the game, and it was just hilarious. And we uh, the fans there go wild for the game as well, and we really like going to Mexico. Obviously, it's close, and you know Canada is a very important market too, and we have to sort through uh, what we're go going to do here. As you guys probably know, for years there was a game. Um, at the Rogers Center, and it just didn't, Buffalo came and played up here, it didn't do that well, so we're rethinking that as well. What are your thoughts on Canada? What are the opportunities here, and how do you Well, feel the opportunities, those? I think, are huge, simply because um, there are so many fans up here, and there are fans of teams. I mean, uh, Bill's mania is crazy, and I've been recently introduced to it because my daughter is dating one of the craziest fans in the world, and his family has had season tickets for I don't know how many, 40 years or something, and, you know, they, uh, I brought, incidentally, I brought him to the Super Bowl, and he, it was a, a great experience. He wore his Bill's jersey. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, look, you have New England Patriots fans towards the East Coast. You've got Central Canada, big Green Bay fans. You've got huge Buffalo fans. You've got big Seattle fans on the West Coast. So there's an opportunity. And I think what we learned from basketball when I was involved with MLSE was you can be a country's team and you, you can do things. So I, I don't know if there's ever going to be a franchise anywhere out, out of the U.S., but I think that we can do more to help CTV and TSN here with... Um, uh, promoting the sport for sure. If you can take you back to the fandom point and how that travels internationally. I imagine you know, a, a, a player like Tom Brady is easy to sell globally because he's got a, a whole celebrity story around him. Probably a, a lot harder or more challenging for... He rides on his wife's coattails, come on. <laughs> yes. Uh, <I'm> just kidding. <laughs> That's what I was trying to say. Uh, how do you market to a global audience a lot of the other players who just are not known and you know, may or may not be as compelling in different cultures? Well, it's, you know, it's really up to the individual player what they want to do um, and who they want to partner with. And if they want to uh, develop a partnership with someone who wants to do something in China or do something in India or do something in you know, these massive population countries, we don't particularly do that. Like as NFL media, we're more focused on the team and everything like that, and we're just starting into this rookie sort of sensation. I mean, it's very easy to sort of say, look, if we promoted, you know, if we spent all this money and promoted, I don't know, Carson Wentz and wherever, but 
we have work to do right here in our own backyard on making these guys super, super famous and having, giving them a presence on social media that's different, something that's creative, something that's engaging, right? That's not just, it's Carson Wentz's birthday today on Facebook, you know, like it's, yeah. We've got, we've got work to do on our own domestic uh, market for sure in making these guys famous. And then, you know, if, if something happens globally, it happens globally. I mean, Tom Brady did a good job of that uh, this summer. And um, we did some work, um, a lot, some players went with Robert Kraft to Israel this year and did some philanthropic work there. It, it centers a lot around philanthropy too in, in other countries. And what's the business model, if I can put it that way, for the individual player in investing so much? They probably have, have been trained literally to think only about playing on the field. And then you're saying to them, hey, you've got to be a global celebrity on social media. Completely different skill set. Uh, how do you incent them or encourage them to do that? It's all about opportunities after they're finished playing. Like, it's really, I mean, you know, you look at Kurt Warner, you look at Michael Irvin, you look at um, some of the uh, great Hall of Famers that uh, currently have jobs in broadcasting or whatever. I mean, it's, um, it's important for the game to keep them engaged. I think that uh, they can have a whole fan following, right? And as more and more um, distribution channels and platforms evolve, there are more and more opportunities for those guys to do uh, different things. Got a Facebook question here about XFL 2020. Uh huh. How do you think about it? Groundhog Threat? Day. Sorry, Groundhog Day. <laughs> seriously? Uh, no, 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 no. I mean, look, everything is a threat, right? We take everything seriously, and it's one more competitor in the. Environment. But we've seen this before, to your point. Yeah. We've seen lots of comp challenger leagues come yeah. along, interesting, and then they fade away. They do, and it's. Um, like we started out the conversation today, it's about the relative importance of content. And, um, you know, it's, we have a huge first mover advantage, if you will, and it's just, it's hard. I mean, there is a lot of really good football on television. And the recent, over the last decade, the college football, the NCAA has really put a lot of fantastic games on television. So, uh, it's, uh, you know, I'm competing with that too, not, a new league starting up. I'm more concerned about, you know, keeping my viewers and um, where I need them in the windows I want them to be in um, and competing with college football. Let's talk a bit about uh, social media and, and the different channels that you're on because you're, you're one of the biggest content uh, players probably on all social media challenge, uh, channels, I should say. So you're, you're gaining insights that everyone could learn from. Maybe mm -hmm. we can uh, talk about three or four of the big channels and what, what you're learning, what you're seeing right. uh, with your experience there. Start, you, you mentioned earlier the, the, the giant one, Facebook. What, uh, what, what are you learning from Facebook? Well, we're new to our relationship with Facebook. And um, what, look, we're learning what everybody else learns. There are a lot of people on Facebook. When you put content there, a lot of people consume it. And the content that we put on Facebook wasn't um, as short form as others might have done. And we made, I think I mentioned it earlier, eight minute, uh, you know, sort of short forms of the entire game. Like you can almost watch all the big plays in eight minutes and we do that. And, and they're, they're well viewed. We don't post them till after the game, obviously. Um, that's well viewed. And then, you know, that's sort of where we're starting. And Facebook does a lot of work with our highlights. We have highlight packages that we, we produce highlights for them and then they use them the way they want to use them. And we're finding consumption is really uh, quite good there, and it's cultivating fans and keeping them in the football ecosystem. Um, Snapchat, we've done some discovery kind of stories on Snapchat, and then we've, you know, we do the normal stuff like build filters and everything like that. But Snap is also, like I'm talking from the league perspective, right? There's, we have 32 franchises that have their own social media platforms and have their own presence. And when you get to the more intimate, um, content, I think that the teams have a, a big role to play and we work hard with them to do that. So they do a lot on Snapchat, they do a lot on Twitter. We do um, quite a bit on Twitter as well. We do a, um, a five day a week show for them, a short show that we you know, talk football and things like that. Um, and it's been reasonably effective. Um, we obviously, Amazon in the States is a streaming partner for Thursday Night Football, and they were very happy with that arrangement this year. They did a good job uh, promoting that, and we did some cross-promotion with them. So uh, they, uh, you know, simulcast mm -hmm. every Thursday Night Football game on, on Amazon, and it worked well. It's not 
how you would typically think of social media, but it's another sort of platform. And how do you see that relationship evolving with Amazon? Well, it's only a one-year deal. We like to, Thursday Night Football has typically been a, um, like a Petri dish for us, right? How do we uh, play with different platforms, play with different broadcasters? And with streaming in particular, we did a deal with Twitter, and, now, and it was a one-year deal, and, and now Amazon came to the table. And look, Amazon is, um, they're a fantastic partner, actually. They, they really did, uh, they were in. They were fully in, and it was a difficult, in the States, it was last year, um, Thursday Night Football was on NBC for eight games or so, CBS for a few games, and NFL Network for a few games, and Amazon streamed them all. So you really had to get all these players around a table, all the marketing executives, and say, we're gonna cross promote. And you know, NBC, when the next Thursday Night Football game goes to NFL Network or to CBS, you're gonna talk about that network on your network. And it was like, woo. But we managed to sort of get everybody to a point where we're building a franchise here, and building a franchise is good for everybody. And Amazon did a, a lot of good work. Obviously, they have tremendous reach, um, and they were a good partner. And they, uh, I mean, they don't disclose sort of, you know, how many people are streaming or whatever. But they they were happy, and they were happy with the ac customer acquisition that they. What they, ma what makes them a great partner? Maybe you can give us some more insight on that. Well, so we learn from them, right? We learn um, best practices and different things. I mean, some of the even the promotional spots they came up with were so interesting. Like they, it was sort of they put football in the jungle, like sort of playing off the Amazon thing. And it was funny and it was innovative and it was cute and it wasn't the usual epic football spots that we're used to. And it was just different and creative. And they're technically, um, it was very interesting actually because it was live sports, they hadn't done that before. Mm. So, you know, it, there was a lot of engineering work in the background to get that to work, but they were fantastic to work with. And I just think going forward, um, they're uh, not just creative in the capital C creative kind of, but they're a creative business people. And I think as we think about the future and disruption and everything we're talking about here, they're the kind of people that you want to be able to talk about those things with. I think you skipped over Instagram. What are, what are you learning from Oh, so Instagram? I include Instagram with Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's the same. We. Uh, do the same, we do little stories and things like that, but basically Instagram, we have our own handle and we post things from time to time, um, but it's really, you know, player focused. We use, we use highlights uh, on Facebook more than we do on Instagram. It's really player focused stuff on Instagram. So I'll pivot on the, the, the player focus to another question about uh, concussions and player health and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and safety. How do you think about those challenges, especially from a content point of view, when people are, are maybe not wanting to watch uh, a sport or highlights where people are getting physically maimed or injured for life? How are, how are you thinking through that uh, It's awfully challenge? dramatic. <laughs> um, you know what, like, there's, it's, it's a rough game. Hockey is a rough game. And one of the things that uh, so many of, in my personal network have asked me, you know, the same kind of question. And what has been impressive to me is at the same time I was hired, a guy, Dr. Sills, was hired who's a neurologist, and he is the league doctor. And I mean, so many things have been um, done to improve the safety of the game. Two things, improve the safety of the game and invest in real neuroscience and CTE research. And there isn't a league out there who's spending more money on neuroscience and CTE research more money on biomechanical engineering of helmets, which um, we take very seriously, and there's a lot of good innovation coming there. And then, obviously, on the concussion protocol, which is Dr. Sill's main job, and that is around, you guys all know, right? If, uh, if a player looks like he's concussed, there's a protocol that he has to follow. I don't know if you noticed it this year, but we have those zip-up tents now, mm -hmm. so a player can go into the tent uh, with a trainer, with an independent doctor, um, it kind of provides for some dignity. It provides for him to be, you know, sort of open and in there and have a moment. Um, and the protocol that we have is uh, the most advanced in the world, and that was Dr. Sills uh, brought that to the league. And we've had, I think, 500 or so over the year, um, you know, concussion protocol uh, you know, instances. And I think four or five times out of that, we have found that 
it wasn't followed correctly. I mean, and those are the ones that you hear about, right? The Russell Wilson one and things like that. So um, I just, I feel like those three pillars are really, really important. And we don't do that for football. Like I'm talking $40 million in research. Like it's, it's, it's real money. And we share all that research. We share it with the NHL, we share it. And it, it's just, it's important. And we spend a lot of time in youth football. We do a lot of coaching. Um, sort of heads up football and play safe football. Um, the pro ball is focused like a lot on youth football. We bring in 1,500 coaches from around the country um, and sort of talk to them about different coaching techniques. So everywhere you look, there's work being done to really improve the health and safety of the game. And it's not limited to sort of head and shoulders injuries. A lot of injuries that are um, kind of career ending are lower extremity uh, injuries and we do a lot of work on turf uh, engineering, cleat engineering and uh, like it's it's really, for me, uh, I'm an engineer and I, I kind of like all that stuff and it's been very, very um, impressive to me the commitment that between the NFL and frankly the NFLPA has, that's the NFL Players Association that represents the players have on um, real investment in people and in money to try and uh, make the game safer. Not including rule changes, which no. there have been like 47 rule changes since 2002 to help make the game uh, safer, right? So it's... And is all of this actually affecting engagement, audience engagement in the, uh, in the game and in the sport? Or are people still tuning in and signing up as, as, as youth at the same levels? I think... Um, Youth football is, um, I think it's performing okay. I mean, it's something that we keep our eye on. We aren't kind of in there all the time looking at it, but youth football is still very, very popular. Um, we, are, we do a lot of work with flag football as well. So, um, you know, some kids are choosing to play flag. Um, I think flag is fantastic because girls play it and then more girls learn about the game. Um, so I, youth football is, is, is strong, and uh, it continues to be strong. A good, uh, another audience uh, Facebook question here about Bill's games in Toronto, not overly successful. So someone may not have enjoyed uh, going to the game here. Um, how, how do you improve the live game experience in, in Canada? Maybe I can add to that sort of your perspective on the live game experience across the league, because it's, it, it's, it's a huge experience, yeah. it's critical. And how do you build almost the, 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 the 360 experience? around that uh, kind of very unique Thursday night or Sunday live experience? Yeah, the experience in the stadium is something else, right? And it's very interesting when you talk to fans. Some people really love it, love the stadium more than television. Some people like television more than the stadium, to be honest. And I think it's the commentary you get in the game, um, the close-up of the replays and things like that. Sometimes the stadiums are huge, right? 75,000, so it's hard to see uh, close in, but the, the spirit and the energy in the stadium is like nothing else, especially places like New England and Green Bay when it's in Buffalo when it's freezing cold and snowing and you're kind of all there um, having some fun. Um, you know, we, it's interesting, we thought a lot about VR and AR and that kind of technology. And, you know, there are, there's, you think, well, maybe we should put someone like in the best seat in the house from a VR perspective or an AR perspective. And I'm not so sure that that's what people want as a companion. Um, if I'm gonna do an AR or something, I'm thinking I want the sack cam. Like I want sort of the top 10 sacks of the week with the, you know, from the quarterback's perspective or the catch cam where it's the top 10 catches of the week or the rush cam, the top 10 rushes of the week where you get to experience that from the, from the perspective of the running back or the quarterback or the wide receiver or whatever. Um, I think those kind of kind of getting inside the game a little bit more, it will be more interesting than um, sort of this notion of virtual reality from the, from the sidelines. But we're, we're talking about from a live game experience, those are the sort of things that we're talking about doing. And the, and the Canadian experience, if you were to... Well, the Canadian back experience here? is interesting. I mean, I think that, that that was years ago, and I think that the uh, it wasn't a particularly good place to watch a football game. You were really far away from the game. I think the pricing of the tickets was a little bit, high, like not a little bit, it was too high and they didn't fill the stadium, so it just felt nasty, right? So it wasn't, um, it wasn't overly successful. I mean, I think, 
we aren't currently thinking about that, about coming back, but I think if we did, it'd just be a different model and we'd make the experience something uh, that's you know, more akin to what we're used to here, like mm -hmm. a full house for the Leafs or a full house for the Raptors or for Toronto FC, you know? Yeah. Getting a lot of questions on diversity and a good one on, from your perspective, being a female going into mm -hmm. obviously a male dominated league. Was that an adjust, a big adjustment for you and how did you, how did you manage that? Um, no, not, you know what, I'll tell you, it's, uh, well, I've always been a woman, so that wasn't a big adjustment. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it wasn't an adjustment at all. I mean, it, it's surprising about, you know, of the senior executives, sort of VP and above at the NFL, 33% or so are women. There are a lot of really strong women. The CIO is a woman, the chief security officer, which is a monster job because she's in charge of all the stadium security and everything like that. Kathy Lanier, she used to be the chief of police in DC. She is scary. Um, <laughs> she's fantastic. And uh, the chief marketing officer is a woman. Um, Rene Anderson, who runs sponsorships, is a woman. Uh, my chief marketing officer for media is a woman. Like it's, we don't feel alone and um, it's pretty normal to be in meetings with you know three four women around the table, it's not wasn't that big an adjustment. I was sort of surprised a little bit. And as a Canadian, well, there that's different. I mean, because I tend to use hockey analogies, and they chirp me hardly hard for that. But uh, I'm teaching them hockey analogies, um, and uh, it's like I think I mentioned it earlier. It's you actually cannot imagine how integrated football is with the American culture. You know, uh, go, going back to the anthem thing, I mean, that was a challenging time, but at the same time, to have a product that is fundamentally tied to the patriotism of the United States of America, it's like, wow, that's, that's like, it's unbelievable, really. You know, it's really, um, it's impressive, the brand, uh, particularly in the States, and it's, um, there's a lot of good being done, right? You asked me the question about uh, players, and you know, there's lots of press about this and that uh, happening with players, but the most uh, prestigious award that the NFL gives out to its players is the Man of the Year Award, and it's for philanthropic work. This year, uh, J.J. Watt won it because of the work that he did in Houston after the hurricanes, but like the runners up, every team nominates a, a person, and the work that these guys do in their communities around, um, you know, sex trafficking, around social justice, around domestic violence, it is truly, truly impressive. And these, these guys are making real the teams in their local markets and the, the young men that play on the teams and, and their partners are doing amazing work in the communities. And I just, that was new to me and it, and it kind of made me more comfortable with my decision. Yeah, no, that's a great, uh, great message. Maybe we can uh, wrap up with a, a, a broader perspective. You've gone from content distribution to content creation. And I'm curious, you know, it's, it's interesting to see every business now in, in a way seeing itself in the content business. Everyone's trying to be a content creator. Mm -hmm. You've gone from distributor to, to creator. What are the insights you've, you, you've drawn in that transition? And what, what should other organizations learn about content creation and content distribution as we move deeper into this world, as you articulated earlier, where there's just way more content than ever? A lot of great content, yeah. but obviously fragmentation. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I want to give props to my Bell Media team, my old Bell Media team. They, they produced a lot of content too, and they continue to produce more, and they've been quite successful at it. Um, and that, and they're a distributor primarily, right? So that is the answer, I think. The NFL is content, right? And I mean, what we, the league built its success on licensing the capability of, that the teams built on the field. Um, to make the transition, you have to figure out what people want, right? And I think that that's, if I look at, um, you know, sort of the work that's being done at Bell Media, for instance, I think they're doing a really good job at that, right? I mean, they're um, into the original content now, and they're the Bad Out of Hell musical came through Bell Media. Um, you know, sort of a, a music show is just being launched. So it's, it's that kind of thinking and work and courage that is going to make the difference in terms of 
tilting the axis a little bit from distribution to creation. And you have to have intestinal fortitude to do that because content creation is inherently a risky business. It's like venture capital, right? I mean, you've got winners and you've got losers, and you hope the winners pay for the losers every single time. So, I mean, it's, it's important. And in 2018, what, uh, what makes great content? What defines the winners? Football. <laughs> what else am I going to say? Yeah. What, but what makes no. it great content? Well, great content is, you know, it's engaging. It's fun. It's something that you want to do with your friends. It's something that, um, you know, if it's live sports, you have to create, uh, you have to be more important than anything else that's going on in that individual time, which is a nuance mm. relative to the video on demand, right? Like, I'm competing against taking your kid to soccer. I'm competing against going for, uh, you know, uh, a date night with your husband when you haven't had one in, you know, two months because you've got little kids. I'm competing against working overtime because it's appointment viewing, right? So. Um, for me, good content will win out on all of that, and it'll be engaging and fun and exciting and, you know, putting a good product on the field where who knows what will happen, like the Minnesota Miracle or the yeah. fourth down play by Nick Foles, like crazy. Like, that's good content where it's unexpected and it's fun and people want to come back. Yeah, the power of the surprise is, yeah, still, uh, is. Yeah. still obviously valuable. That's a wonderful insight. Uh, thank you so much. And before we go, I'd like to mention that as a token of our appreciation, a donation is being made to the Sick Kids Foundation. And Marianne, I wonder if you might say uh, a few words about uh, this charity and what it, what it means to you. Well, it, it's, I just think it's a fundamentally important charity in the country and globally. I think it's an important charity globally. Actually, Chairman of your board, Katie, asked me to sit on the foundation with her. She's chair of the foundation. and. Um, it's uh, the work that they do um, is phenomenal. It makes you cry and it makes you smile. And I just feel so fortunate that I have never had to use the services of sick kids with two uh, grown children now. Um, but it's a fantastic group of people and the work they do and the uh, quality of the global researchers they bring in is second to none. And it was just important for me to help Katie with that. Oh, that's great. It is truly one of the world's uh, great hospitals, and people like you are making it uh, even better. Thank you so much uh, for your time Thanks. today, Marianne, and for all you're your, your doing, and good luck with all you're doing with uh, the NFL. Uh, to our audience, both here and on Facebook and WebEx, thank you for joining us. Please mark your calendars for March 28th. Our next disruptors will be on the coming skills revolution, and it will be part of our rollout of uh, Future Launch, which is RBC's 10-year uh, commitment to the future of youth. This is a $500 million commitment by RBC to helping the next generation prepare for the future of work. So we'll have lots of exciting conversations on, uh, on March 28th, but stay tuned uh, and through RBC Connect for details. And please be sure to register to our, or for our mailing list. You can also subscribe to uh, RBC Disruptors podcast, which we'll be uh, recording with uh, Marianne in the next uh, couple of days. You can find that on uh, SoundCloud or iTunes. Marianne, thank you again for joining great. us Thanks, here. Sean. And everyone, have a great Thanks, day.